everybody. Welcome to session 65 of the Behavioral Observations podcast. Today's podcast is sponsored by the Next Gen Revolution Summit and the Precision ABA Workshop, both of which are coming up right around the corner. So you can get more information on both of those events at the show notes to this episode at behavioralobservations.com. Um, but as far as today's episode is concerned, my guest today is Dr. Matt Norman, who's a professor of psychology at the University of the Pacific. And we conducted this interview live in front of, uh, in front of an audience. Uh, it was an actual audience of, say, like 40 or 50 people. It was fantastic. We were at the Hoosier Association for Behavior Analysis Conference, which took place last week. And we did this at the Skyline Club, which is a very uh, very fancy venue in the city of Indianapolis. We were up at the 36th floor overlooking the city, and it was just a fantastic time. Uh, and, and again, I, I have to give a shout out to Danielle and Kyle, as well as the other board members at, at Hoosier ABA. They made us feel so welcome. Uh, it was such an awesome event, and I think if you are in that area of the world, and you um, you should put this on your list of events to attend next year. It was, I just, I could go on and on about how much fun I had, but I don't, we need to get to the interview at some point or another. So, um, yeah, so Matt graciously agreed to be the guinea pig for this episode, and we, uh, again, talk about his research in encouraging physical activity in school-age children. Uh, we talk about, um, you know, his uh, uh, hopes and dreams for the field as well, as well as things that he's worried about. And we also had a really fun segment of audience participation. So if you've listened to this podcast before, you know I usually solicit questions for the audience that I read, uh, you know, to the guest. Well, because we had a live audience, we had people come up and actually take the mic. And what was funny is that we had a bunch of these uh, uh, drink tickets for the for the evening social events. So I, I in, uh, reinforced participation with, with drink tickets. So um, it, I think it was a, a reinforcement model that, that worked out, uh, that, it, that exceeded my expectations, let's just say. So Anywho, uh, again, I can go on and on about Haba, but um, uh, I, I will have some pictures of the event uh, at behavioralobservations.com as well as uh, on my, uh, my Instagram page, which is at behavioralobservations. So you can check those out there if you want to see some of the, the scenes. Uh, you know, again, it was just really cool being up at the 36th floor. Uh, uh, as I mentioned it in the interview itself, but uh, our friends from Clinical Behavior Analysis uh, even brought some some uh, bourbon from Kentucky because uh, it's not too far from where we were at the time. So a, a lot of folks from Kentucky drove up to the event. And uh, yeah, it was just a fantastic time. So one last thing I'd ask before we get to the interview itself is that uh, give me some feedback on what you think about doing the, these types of live uh, live interviews. I had a ton of fun, uh, but I want to hear from you to see if it's something that you want to hear more of, and that's the case. Uh, just go to behavioralobservations.com and hit the contact page and leave me some feedback, or you can uh, reach out to me uh, either on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever. Uh, and, uh, yeah, just let me know what you think and if you, if this is something you want to hear more of. So, uh, I think that's pretty much it. So let's get right to this fun conversation with Dr. Matt Normand. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Again, everyone, thanks for joining us tonight. <laughs> that was my fault, not yours. So I didn't have the right button pushed down. So uh, you guys have joined us on an experiment because I've never done this before. I've never done a live podcast before. All the podcasting I've done, and there's various people who've been on the show here before, I do it from my basement, right? So... Uh, to be here at a conference, to be among these colleagues, to have this view of uh, the city, uh, to have awesome guests and awesome hosts. It's just a real treat for me. So um, before we get going, let's, uh, let's welcome Matt Normand. Matt, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. All right, very cool. So Matt, you've done double duty today. You gave the keynote address, and then you... Uh, uh, 
pitched in at the last minute for a uh, panel discussion. So uh, one of the things I wanted to do is, uh, while we're getting our, our money's worth, is to <laughs> pick your brain and go a little bit of a deeper dive on some of the topics that you talked about this morning and maybe get to some things that uh, uh, you didn't talk about and, and perhaps have the opportunity to kind of go into more depth with. So. Before we get to that, another shout out to Stephen Foreman from CBA. He hooked us up with some uh, some fine bourbon here. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that we're doing this during the social hour and that everyone has a, a beverage of choice in their hands. I think that's going to make us sound a lot funnier. Uh, uh, I'm already funnier well, right now. That's right. That's right. I, yeah. um, so anyway... Everyone who's heard the podcast before kind of knows the first question out of the gate. So let's hear the origin story. How did you first contact behavior analysis? What got you interested in it? And what made you think, hey, this is a career I want to be involved in in the long term? All right. Well, well, this is a, a story I have told, and, and it'll take a little bit. Um, and it starts with my uh, undistinguished high school career. I basically stumbled out of high school and then tripped into college. And the college that I went to was a small school. It was the only college that accepted me in Western Massachusetts, Western New England College, now Western New England University. Uh, luckily, I'd already decided that that was the school I wanted to go to before I knew no other college accepted me. Um, so I felt all right. But I went to freshman orientation the summer before my freshman year, uh, not really knowing what I wanted to do, but you had to declare a major going into this small, mostly liberal arts school. And the only class I could tolerate in high school was a half-year psychology course that I took. So I said, psychology major. And they assigned me an advisor during that summer orientation session from the psychology department, and that was Hank Schlinger. And some of you might know Hank Schlinger. He's a fairly well-known behavior analyst. I didn't know this at the time, the department was tiny. Now everybody knows it because Greg Hanley's there, Rachel Thompson's there, and a bunch of other people. But at the time, there were four faculty members. Two of them were behavioral. One was a behavior therapist, and one was Hank Schlinger. And so I was introduced to Hank during that summer orientation, and uh, Hank spent a lot of time asking me questions about my high school experiences and what I thought I was good at. And he sized me up pretty quickly and said, okay, your first semester, don't worry about the topic. I'm just gonna put you with the best teachers at this school, no matter the topic. That's what you need. And of course, one of the best teachers he determined was him. Um, so he <laughs> registered me for his intro psych course. And the first class I ever took in college was 8 a.m. Monday morning with Hank Schlinger, Intro to Psychology. And the first day, I remember people saying, you should sit up front in the front row if you want to do well. So I did. And Hank spent the entire first day just telling us how to succeed in his class, explaining why the class was structured the way it was, uh, how we should study the study objectives and all this. And I said, you know what? This guy, he, he, first of all, he had longish hair. He wore cargo shorts and Tevas, which I thought was cool, and like a Dallas Cowboys t-shirt. And then I looked at the textbook and he was an author on the textbook, which I, I was like, whoa, he must know what he's talking about. So I'm going to listen to him. I'm going to do everything he said. And so I went from barely graduating high school to graduating with a 3.9 from undergrad because I listened to Hank. And Hank put me in touch with other people. He introduced me to Dave Palmer. I did an internship with him as an undergrad. And he's the one who told me to go to grad school. My, so my first exposure to behavior analysis was from Hank and then from Dave Palmer. And it was really the, the experimental analysis of behavior and the conceptual analysis of behavior. Um, they convinced me that Western Michigan was the place you wanted to go. Uh, they said you should go take every class you can with Jack Michael, but if you want to learn to do research, you should probably try to work with Al Poling. And luckily that worked out for me. But when I got to Western Michigan, I had no idea you could get a job in behavior analysis. I, that, that would blow my mind. I, just, I was just fired up about the experimental analysis of behavior. Well, I think that's in uh, Dick Malott's book, even in the earlier editions of uh, Principles of Behavior. He gave a lot of examples, because that's the book I used as an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. And I think you and I are probably similar vintage. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, I remember that book had lots of applied examples, even way back then in the, in the mid-90s or early 90s, depending on one's point of view. But anyway, even with OBM and, and other types of things, and I remember that 
resonating like hey, there's actually stuff you can do that's practical and you know the logic of behavior analysis is pretty there's a through line through that as opposed to some of the yeah. other disciplines in psychology so yeah. no doubt and, and i have to say that i was and maybe still am most interested in sort of this the science of our field, and uh, I also, I've told Ray Miltenberger this in the past, that basically Ray Miltenberger taught me applied behavior analysis because I actually taught a course in applied behavior analysis at Florida State University before, well actually, I've never taken a course in applied behavior analysis in my life. I've never had an applied behavior analysis course. So my actual education came from teaching applied behavior analysis using Ray Miltenberger's intro text. Uh, really, my schooling all up until that point was mostly in the basic experimental analysis of behavior and the conceptual analysis, and that's what got me most excited about the field. I see. And um, I know you sent me your CV, but you did, did you go through all the way at Western, or did you go down to Florida? What, yeah. What's the time? I got my master's degree uh, at Western, and then I got a master's and PhD at Florida State, and I worked with John Bailey at I Florida see. State. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. So I also know from your CV that some of your earlier work was in what we might consider kind of traditional behavior applied areas in terms of doing some stuff uh, in the uh, DD world. But as you talked about this morning, or at least teased us this morning, like a lot of your work in involves um, uh, encouraging uh, more activity, more physical activity in school age kiddos. So tell us a little bit how that interest was cultivated. Sure. I mean, it's kind of hard to reconstruct. I don't know that I can tact all of the relevant variables. I do know that, unlike a lot of folks, uh, I did not get into this field through autism. I, I didn't have that experience that wasn't an interest of mine. I did some of that work because, honestly, I thought it was important to do, given how prevalent it was in our field. I thought I should learn something about it. But it was never something that I wanted to do. And when I got my first faculty position at uh, Florida Tech, I was in a nice position. They wanted me to do something, but I wasn't hired because I did something specific. What I was going to do was sort of left open to me. And so I took that opportunity. What do I want to do? And I'm not sure why physical activity and health won out. It, it's always been an interest. I actually, at Western Michigan, I worked as a personal trainer to sort of pay the bills and stuff. Um, but I think probably most of the answer is that it was of interest to me. It was obviously a problem of great social significance. And physical activity is something that we have great strategies we can use to measure it, right? So in if you want to look at obesity, obviously eating is as important, if not more important, but I couldn't readily figure out how to reliably measure eating. But I could come up with ways, uh, even mechanically, to measure physical activity. So the practicality, I think, led me to physical activity as a focus. Are you interested in the intersection of entrepreneurship, behavior analysis, and clinical application? Then you want to check out the Next Gen Revolution Summit Conference, which is taking place on November 10th and 11th in Las Vegas. Uh, we've heard about this conference before because we've talked to former guest Ryan O'Donnell, and this is the third annual conference that he's put on. It's really going to be a, a great one. It will feature speakers such as Janet Twyman, and there'll be all sorts of folks talking about the cutting edge of, uh, of, of clinical application technology and entrepreneurship. So if you want to check that out, you can go to nextgenrevolutionsummit.com. And if you want to save a few bucks in the process, use offer code Matt. So you can go to nextgenrevolutionsummit.com forward slash Matt for more details. The cool thing about this, too, is that if you can't make it to Vegas, they are going to live stream this. So you can take in all the events without even having to get off the couch. How about that? So, again, for more details, go to nextgenrevolutionsummit.com forward slash Matt. So as you were kind of taking that on, did you ever interact with any like sports medicine or uh, other types of uh, interest areas on whether it's Florida Tech or elsewhere? Because I can think of like a lot of those uh, experiments and in in, in, in a lot of those literatures have like, you know, measuring wattage on a stationary bicycle and stuff like that and stuff that's very, very, you know, measurable. And right. did, have you, did you get involved in any of that stuff? Uh, not at Florida Tech. 
per se. Uh, I dabbled a bit when I first got to the University of the Pacific. Uh, we have a uh, health exercise sports sciences program, and there were some folks there doing some of that work that I worked with for a while. And we have a phys physical therapy program. Um, and, and I do think that's valuable and that's important. But honestly, uh, currently it doesn't influence a lot of my work. I think if I did larger scale studies where we were looking at more global measures of improvement, that would be a very useful collaboration. But I sort of went back um, and s really got into the behavior analysis of the whole thing, which I don't think is the only way to go but it's the way that I went. So I don't necessarily have a lot of collaborators outside of our field. The, the reason I asked that, it just occurred to me that I know a lot of those studies, you know, if, uh, so for example, if you're comparing like high intensity interval training versus steady state cardio, if I'm not mistaken, most if not all the work is, are, are groups designs. A lot of it, yeah, I mean, not exclusively, but a lot of it. And it would be interesting to take step someone through a single subject analysis of their performance over time given various protocols and things like that. And so that would be kind of an area that perhaps is not being, may not be yeah. being adequately explored right now. I, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity. And, and so I'll, I'll tell a story about this. Um, Pat Fryman, this was years ago, and I don't think Pat rem remembers it. I remind him of it all the time, but he doesn't remember it, I don't think. I was, I think, still a graduate student. I was at a FABA conference, and Pat was in the bar. And I went up to Pat at the With bar, sunglasses. It, with sunglasses in the bar. And so I went up to Pat and introduced myself and said, you know, here's who I am and here's what I'm interested in. And of course, Pat said, sit down. He bought me a drink, and he gave me some advice. At the time, he was the editor of Jabba. I think he had uh, just taken on the editorship. And he said, there is so much work out there that's promising, especially in sort of behavioral clinical psychology, but it's not quite the way we would do it. It's good, it's, it's good, but it's not quite the way we would do it. It doesn't have the repeated measures and things like that. And he said, my advice to you is go find that work, and I won't name the names of the people, uh, but they're prominent people outside of our field, and do it the way we would do it. So don't reinvent it. Just go find that work and do it the way we would do it. And that's a way to get started. And um, so I didn't listen to him. Uh, I didn't do that. <laughs> but I kind of did, actually. I just found different work. And that's what I was alluding to this morning, is that I really looked um, to Brian Awada, people like Tim Vollmer, and the work that they had done in the assessment and treatment of problem behavior. And mostly what I did is what Pat told me to do with the other research, with that research. I didn't reinvent the wheel. I just took what others had already done, and in this case, I applied it to a new area. I see. So that brings us to encouraging more physical activity in school-aged children for the reasons you described earlier at the panel, because they're a, a captive audience, uh -huh. uh, to paraphrase you. so. Um, Matt, why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the interventions that you've seen that work really well to increase uh, the activity for, for uh, little ones? Sure. Um, so we've looked at a number of things, and I don't think there's a silver bullet, right? Like anything else that we do, we understand that we have to take the individual as they come. At some point, you'd like group-level interventions, but really, the individuals come to you with unique histories, and you have to be sensitive to that. So a lot of the sort of assessment and treatment work that we've done has shown pretty clearly that um, social consequences are really powerful for most kids, especially even adult consequences. And the thing that stood out in almost all of the studies we've done is that adult interaction is critical. So we get the biggest bang for our buck when kids engage in moderate to vigorous physical activity, when adults then play with them in that moderate to vigorous physical activity. That seems to be one of the biggest things you can do. Um, and by the way, it's probably not bad for the adult either, right? To, Clearly. To get up and do that. So it sounds like there's a behavioral intervention perhaps on two levels. Right, right. A, a recal yeah. One for the recalcitrant adult, you know, if, if, if you have people who are not inclined to do that, and of course uh -huh. the, 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 the range contingencies for the kiddos. Yeah, yeah. And uh, 
So on the individual level, that seems to be a pretty powerful thing. Does it work for every kid? No. And of course, it depends on who the adult is and, and all of that. Um, people always bring up, well, what about their peers? And we're starting to look at that, but that's a lot more difficult it, from a research perspective to sort of control how peers interact with kids. But we're, we're moving in that direction. Um, the, the other thing we looked at, we have a paper coming out in Java looking at uh, token reinforcement. Uh, for ki because social reinforcement doesn't always work just in terms of attention and interaction. Um, but we've got a pretty workable sort of token economy system that seems effective. But one of the things we've become really interested in is uh, what I was talking about this morning, the good behavior game. Mm -hmm. So um, we've got a couple of studies on that now adapting the good behavior game, using it for physical activity with kids at recess and in physical education classes. All right, so some people who are listening to this uh, did not have the benefit of hearing your explanation of the good behavior game this morning. Mm -hmm. um, so can you step us through the, I guess, the Twitter version or the Cliff Notes version of, uh, of what the good, good behavior game is? I'll take Cliff Notes. Twitter is way too brief. All right. Um, so well, I guess Spark Notes <laughs> these days, but uh, I guess we're, we're dating ourselves again, apparently. Um, so the good behavior game, as it's typically used, is a simple intervention, often in classrooms, where you basically divide the class in half, two equal teams. You explain the rules to the team, like no talking out of turn, no getting out of your seat, yada, yada, yada. And then each time a member of a team breaks a rule, there's some indication that that happened, and usually it's like a mark on the board. And the deal is, at the end of the class period, the team with the fewest marks wins. And they win something that's usually not too substantial, like the winning team gets to line up first for recess or something like that. And it's just remarkably effective. And that's for classroom management. Okay, so let me, let me before we map that onto physical activity, okay. you mentioned that, that a lot of the good behavior game work is being done in the schools, yeah. in the Stockton area, in the, for the applied to the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, I, I love the good behavior game and I'm um, familiar with um, you know, some of the research and some of the earlier stuff because I think it was first talked about in like the late 60s yeah. and there was a giant uh, randomized control trial in the, in the 80s in the, in the city of Baltimore. So um, it does have quite a bit of uh, uh, evidence behind it. But one of the things that I'm curious uh, about is that sometimes uh, I think they're called saboteurs, and are are you familiar with uh, that term and as it yeah, relates yeah. to good? Yeah, so mm -hmm. so what do you do uh, or what's what have you seen effective with kids who uh, are like purposely torpedoing their team and and things like that when they play the good behavior game? Because I, I I recommend the good behavior game quite a bit, and mm -hmm. that's one of the biggest yeah but questions I, I get from teachers. So yeah. just while uh, while while the subject is has come up, I want to kind of pick your brain on that. Honestly, for the most part, we haven't encountered it. Really, so, it's not something that personally. I've had experience with. I, I know what you're talking about, but we've not really had that as a problem in the versions that we've used. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, because usually I've seen some recommendations. You know, you put that one kid on extinction, or you have them play on a team by themselves, which I'm, you know, not super. I, I haven't tried that. I just don't feel very good about that. You know, it's pretty isolating. But I was just curious to see. Mm -hmm. So anyway, all right. So let's talk about the good behavior game as it relates to physical activity. So step us through how you set that up and what you were measuring and all that stuff. Yeah, so I mean, it's pretty similar, but it's certainly not identical. There are some limitations. Uh, what we do, so for example, if it's at recess, we still have two teams. Um, you can either just randomly assign those teams or sometimes we look at baseline levels of activity and try to match the teams so that you don't have one team of superstars and one team of uh, dandelion pickers, uh, to <laughs> allude to something this morning, right? Um, it's Kyle's contribution. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, divide them in half. They wear belts with colored flags on them that identify the teams. They're told they're, they wear pedometers, so that's the key measure. And they're told that the team with the most steps wins. And you want to run around, climb on things, and be active. The team with the most steps wins. Um, so they go out there and they play, and they've got the pedometers on. We don't have a system, it's just not feasible, or we haven't figured it out yet, to have a sort of marks thing. Like, when they're not being 
active, we put a mark somewhere. That doesn't work. So instead, what we've done is on a time-based schedule, we just deliver prompts reminding them to be active. But there's no obvious marks. Uh, well, at least not yet. We actually have a study going on right now that's looking at feedback. But to date, we haven't. And that's it. And at the end of the class, as they're marching into the classroom, they turn over their pedometers to us. And then what we do is we use the uh, average step total because if the teams, if students aren't there on one day, it can be a disadvantage if you just go by totals mm -hmm. because if one team has more students than the other. So we go on average step totals and the team with the highest step total wins. Uh, and in our experiences, we've been using things like uh, a lot of the schools have good behavior lotteries where students for engaging in good behavior get a raffle ticket that they enter and they seem to like to use that. Um, so there's two consequences. The immediate one is they get a step it up champ badge because we call it the step it up game. It's our thing. Uh, they get the step it up champ, champ badge that then they can exchange for something like the raffle ticket for the good behavior lottery. And that's it. Simple. And it works. This episode is sponsored by the Precision ABA workshop from our good friends at Chartlytics. This will be taking place November 15th and 16th in the beautiful city of Indianapolis, Indiana. You know, I am actually recording this commercial from my hotel room here at India. We just wrapped up the Hoosier ABA conference, and boy, what a great town this is. So if you're in the area and you want to, or if you're out from out of the town and you want to visit and check it out, man, what a, what a great city. And, uh, oh yeah, and the content is pretty cool too. You know, I spent some time with Rick over um, the weekend here at the conference, and he's, uh, he's really excited for this workshop. Uh, the um, having participated in some of Rick's workshops in the past and having seen him just present here at uh, Hoosier Abba, boy, is he really good at what he does. And he is going to teach you how to supercharge your ABA practice. So for more details, go to chartlytics.com forward slash events. And if you want to save a few bucks in the process, use the offer code MATT. All right, I hope you get a chance to check that out. What do you see as you're measuring the pedometers when they come in. And is this during, I'm sorry, is this during gym or is this during recess or is it both? Or We've what? done it in both places. We've done it at recess and physical education class. Got it. So the, the, the students come in from, say, recess. How distributed are the, the step counts ac across groups? I'm just curious. Like, do they all kind of get with the program and they're running? Like, is it, are they tightly clustered or is it kind of a, do you have some kids who are, like, really inactive and you get some kids who, you know, are super active and there's some, you know, majority of people in the middle. Can there's, you describe that a little bit? There's always a range. Um, but what we do look at the individual data and what we do consistently see, though, is everybody, for the most part, takes more steps when they're playing the good behavior game than when they're not. So even though there, you're right, there is going to be a range. Some kids are more likely to take more steps more often than other kids. But there's an overall increase with very few exceptions on an individual level as well. So all kids are taking more steps during the good behavior game, even if they're not taking as many steps as other members of their team might be. I see. So that's like the, the rising tide is lifting all the boats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, were there any uh, findings from this line of research that were surprising to you or um, were, were, were perhaps prompts for future uh, investigation? Uh, well, it's... I think every study we've done, and not just in the good behavior game, has led to new questions. I mean, it's uh, this morning I was mentioning what I see as the importance of programmatic research in our field, where you follow things through to completion. You try to solve problems rather than dropping in, doing a couple of studies, and then backing out. And so I think at the end of every study, there are questions to be asked in the next study, which is a great thing. I mean, it, it leads to a lot of nice research. If the, I want to go in a slightly different direction, though. If it's something that was surprising, and this is not from the good behavior game stuff, but it goes back a number of years when we were doing our functional analysis work, in that kind of research, we video record all sessions, and we score. I say we. My graduate students have to sit in front of the video monitor and score second by second data. I need I some graduate students. I couldn't <laughs> offer them anything in terms yeah. of credit or anything like that, but that would so, be incredibly useful to have. So it's the collective we, but they actually do it. Um, 
you see a lot of what kids do, right? Because you're video recording recesses and everything. And um, I guess this might be controversial, but the thing that surprised me is kids are terrible, awful human beings. <laughs> the things they do to each other when the teacher's backs are turned and stuff, it's shocking to me anyways that these elementary school kids, like second graders, first graders, they're devious. So that, that, it's, it's that was surprising. A little Dar me. Darwinism uh, going yeah. on, perhaps. Uh -huh. um, so you mentioned a, 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 a token intervention, uh, and was that separate from the good behavior game? Yes. Okay, yeah, so yeah. Well, step us through how that might work. Um, so that's uh, a study. We have one study on this. And part of the reason for doing the study is because years ago, we started with sort of kitchen sink interventions. We thought, oh, well, it must be easy to get kids to be more active at recess. What we'll do is a sort of token economy. We'll tell them, hey, you need to be more active. And if you are, you'll get tickets for a prize box. Yeah, yeah. It turns out it doesn't work that well. Uh, it's not that easy. But it stands to reason that it should work if you do it correctly. So the study that I'm referring to was an attempt to really do a nice token economy with some training on the token economy, a nice level system. Um, and essentially what it entailed is having a kid go out and they're playing on the playground with fixed equipment, so like you know jungle gyms they can climb on. Uh, that's a, a kind of physical arrangement that tends to promote more moderate to vigorous physical activity than others. So they're out there, they're in that environment, and um, when they're observed to engage in MVPA, it's just announced that they earned you know, a sticker. And the sticker goes on the chart. And in this case, it was a rocket ship chart. And it had different levels. So when you filled up one level, you got to choose one thing from one prize box. If you filled up the next level, you got to choose one thing from the first prize box and one thing from the second prize box. And of course, there were elevating prizes as you went up. Um, and then we compared that with a condition in which we delivered the same stickers, the same tokens, yoked to the delivery in the actual contingent token condition. So they got the same number of tokens at the same time they did in the previous conditions, but it didn't matter what they did. Um, and you know what we found is not surprising is that under the token condition, they engaged in a lot of MVPA, and under the NCR control condition, they didn't engage in much MVPA. I see. So from a, I guess, social validity, uh, validity standpoint, um, if you are advising someone to kind of solve this problem of increasing vigorous physical activity, uh, which direction would you lead them towards the good behavior game or a token system or maybe something else? Depends on the circumstance, right? So, uh, you know, in schools, I think the good behavior game is a really promising strategy to, to put into practice, standard practice. Um, but there's also something to worry about. So, for example, Stockton, if you don't know about Stockton, California, it's, it's kind of a rough city. I mean, it, it, it's not a place that people from elsewhere go, you know what, I think I'm going to move to Stockton has problems. Um, it's not necessarily safe in many places that people live to just let your kids run around and play outside. So if you want to provide opportunities for your kids to be active, you might have to take them somewhere to supervise them, like take them to a playground. And if you think about that circumstance, then you'd want to maximize the time you have there. So when you're there, you want your kids being active because this is precious, right, the time. Right. And under those circumstances, I think I'd be leaning more towards the kind of adult interaction with them when they're engaged in VPA and looking at that level of things. But if we're, again, dealing in a public school or something, I think the good behavior game is kind of a direction you'd want to move. You're not going to have teachers doing individual assessments and individual interventions necessarily for kids to be active. Got it, got it. Um, do you have other lines of research or things that are, that are, that are cooking in the, in the Normand lab that you want to share with us? Uh, let's see. Well, we're, we're doing some more uh, good behavior game stuff. We're looking at the different kinds of feedback that could be provided during the course of the game for physical activity and how that affects physical activity. We, um, we do some things, though, that aren't. Well, actually, there's another thing that we're looking at right now is with adults. 
and it's contingency management, so providing incentives for engaging in physical activity. And we do know that deposit contracts work where people deposit their own money to be earned back, and that's a low-cost way to deliver contingency management. We also know that lottery-based systems where they don't necessarily contact the monetary outcomes each time they meet their goal, but instead they get an opportunity to win one of those outcomes if they meet their goal, they work. So what we're investigating right now, we have a group of adult participants, we're using Fitbits as a measurement device in their everyday lives, and it's a pooled deposit contract lottery system. And the deal is this, they enroll in a cohort. Everybody deposits, I think it's like $42, but all of that money gets put into a pool and the lottery is paid out from a pool. And what that means is you have the potential of earning a lot more than you put in based on the lottery. Or you might just earn back what you put in or you might not earn back what you put in. It's like a football pool. Yeah, and it could conceivably be a way to run these programs with some pretty low cost because at the end of it, there ends up being leftover. All of the money is not paid out. Now, for research purposes, at the end of the study, we actually do return everybody's money. They don't know that. They don't know that's going to happen at the beginning. But that's the idea. But as a model to develop and run these interventions, you could actually end up with a sustaining model to provide contingency management for this. So we're doing that. Um, but we have some unrelated studies, too. So we've uh, we published one study and we're, we're getting ready to submit another uh, using equivalence-based instruction, online equivalence-based instruction, to teach college students critical thinking skills, which I don't know if you've noticed, but that is sorely needed, like with everybody. Um, so we've started small and we're teaching them logical fallacies, how to identify logical fallacies, and we're trying to program for generalization where they can move from the basic teaching arrangement match to sample to still being able to identify those same logical fallacies in more complicated naturalistic kinds of contexts, which it turns out, as we know, is not easy to do. For sure, for sure, and that sounds, sounds pretty interesting. Um, all right, so what I wanna do is kinda switch gears here a little bit and talk about your a kind of view of the field as someone who's been practicing for a while or teaching for a while in the, uh, and I, lo I love that you joked about the ivory tower earlier, but. but yeah, I have no useful skills. <laughs> don't, don't call me a practitioner. I can't help anybody. Well, you're helping kids move around a little bit uh, in, in Stockton, so there, there seems to be some, I wouldn't discount it to, uh, too much, but, um, uh, but you have a perspective. Uh, we can maybe quibble over the validity of it, but we'll we'll assume that there's there's some some of it there uh, for the purposes of this question. So, um, so I'd like to ask you kind of like a, a question with kind of two uh, opposing parts to it. You know, what 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 things are you excited about as it relates to the development of our field, and conversely, what keeps you up at night or what worries you about where we are as a field, where things could potentially go, mm -hmm. and the like. Sure, oh, I have lots of things I could say. Um, I, I think the first thing is there's a lot to be excited about. I mean, our field in many ways is thriving. Even, I mean, I, I'd like to think I'm not that old, although I actually caught a glimpse of myself in the elevator mirrors today and was a little bit horrified. I was like, oh my God, I'm old. Uh, but when I started even attending ABBA, and, and it was probably the same for you, it was a much smaller conference. And I'm not talking going back to the golden years here. It, it's been an explosion in terms of the nother, number of people in this field. And even regional conferences like this, you could never have had this. Even you know, 10, 15 years ago, you didn't see this. That's positive. I mean, there, uh, what other way are you gonna look at it? That's positive. There's lots of people in our field. Um, so I'm excited about that. I mean, there are people interested in behavior analysis. They're not necessarily always interested in the things I'm interested in, but diversity is good. Um, but some people are really concerned and make this known. And so here's my view on this. You hear people sometimes criticize the practitioners 
the master's level behavior analysts. They don't know the science well enough. They're not interested enough in the conceptual stuff. They haven't read the original Skinner stuff. They haven't read Sidman. They're not well versed in the philosophy of our science. Um, I think that's misplaced. I have concerns, which I'm gonna talk about, but I think what we have is largely a technological field, and I don't mean that pejoratively. We have a field largely of master's level practitioners who are board certified behavior analysts who are out on the front lines providing services. And that's incredibly important, and that's the sign of a healthy, robust technology of behavior change. I don't think you find any other field where at that level you would expect those people to be master scientists, to be the most skilled analysts and everything else. No, they have a job to do. They want to produce meaningful changes in the behavior of the clients they serve. That's what they do. I think the frustration is misplaced, and this is my concern that keeps me up. What we don't have is a thriving basic science of behavior in our field. What we don't have is an explosion in people at research universities developing, carrying out cutting edge lines of research in the experimental analysis of behavior. Those are the people that you expect are going to be intimately concerned with the experimental analysis of behavior with the conceptual underpinnings of our field. You shouldn't expect it from the masses of master's level practitioners who are trying to do a job. I mean, some of them will have an appreciation of that stuff and, and be fired up by it. I think what those people and what I'm concerned about and frustrated about is we haven't been able to grow our basic science. And if you look, in the glory days, even though we weren't huge in numbers like we are now, we were in the halls of Harvard, Columbia, UCLA, I mean top tier institutions. We're not there anymore. We don't have visibility in those places and I think that is reason con for concern. I don't think it's reason to bash master's level BCBAs and say you need to be this, no. <laughs> We have to figure out why aren't we producing people who go into those areas and why aren't we giving them the skills necessary to get those positions to be at those places because we're not. Do you think the explosion of the marketplace for applied services has kind of sucked up those people who maybe have an interest in behavior analysis and they're like, oh, you know, kind of like what you were saying earlier today about like the marketplace is over here and this is where the money is and all that stuff. Do you think that's playing a role or? You know, I, I mean, maybe a little bit, but honestly, I don't think so. I, I think it's selecting from a different population of people. I see. Um, and the folks who go into other areas of psychology or related fields outside of psychology, that's a much larger, more competitive population. That's just the reality of it. I'm including myself in that. You know, when we look at the places we go to graduate school that we got selected for, that's nothing like what these other areas. I mean, we're not going to Harvard. We're not going to Columbia. Most of us aren't candidates there. That's an issue. That's a big problem. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I think most of the people probably who are master's level BCBAs in practice, that's what they want to do. That, I mean, it's not that they ended up there because they wanted to go somewhere else and didn't get it. No, that's the work they want to do. Why aren't we getting those other people? And part of it is if we're not in those places, in those hallways, how are those bright students going to find out about us and even want to go on? Well, it kind of sounds like the origin story of uh, Ogden Lindsley's entrance into behavior analysis. I think he was a physics major and randomly happened across a, uh, a Skinner talk, and the rest is uh, yeah. charting history. And there are um, easy answers to this problem. It's I, not like you can wave the wand and, oh, now we have positions and well, researchers. One of the things, as you were kind of mentioning that, is uh, I was thinking of is a, a lot of the, not a lot, but and this is just my own perspective, but a, a lot of folks who are around doing the, you know, hardcore EAB stuff, um, when I was an undergraduate in psychology and a, and a young graduate student, um, a lot of those folks 
actually had engineering backgrounds or STEM type backgrounds, mm-hmm. you know, like Tony Nevin, Randy Grace, uh, even Chris Newland, mm-hmm. uh, all those folks, in, you know, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, computer science, you know, um, and it might, might have been, and I don't remember the, it, the moment each one of those folks stumbled across behavior analysis and started right. to, you know, think that they wanted to pursue it, but it seems like based on what you're saying, the, the, the likelihood of that happening is probably remarkably lower now given the, the, the way things have kind of shifted. Yeah, I think it is. And, and I don't have, you know, this is a, an opinion based on informal observation, right? I don't have data to support this. Of course, yeah. Uh, but in the same way, uh, I, I think if we go way back to the early field, the, the, the days that really spawned some of our most esteemed scientists, it might also be related to they were in a world where they didn't have JAB and Java and ABAI. They had to make their way in the larger world. You had to do things that were good enough, important enough that it would get published in mainstream journals, that people who weren't Skinnerian, so to speak, saw the relevance of it and were willing to publish it. And if you look at the Vitas, of some of our most esteemed scientists, their vitas don't look like ours, especially from their early days. They're publishing in science, in nature, in places like that, not just Java and JAB. But when that became available, it was more comfortable to do that. And I don't think that's all bad. I think that helped in a lot of ways uh, for our field to develop those journals and be able to do that. But things have changed. Uh, in a variety of ways, and I don't think necessarily for the betterment of our basic science. And I don't know how we fix that at this point. I see. Uh, any other thoughts on your, your hopes and dreams or the uh, uh, topics of despair or <laughs> anything else in between? Is you know, I, I hope our, our field continues to grow, but I hope it continues to diversify. Uh, and that's important because without variation, you are at the mercy of abrupt changes in the environment, right? If there's no variations to be selected by a changed environment, you might go extinct. And as important as our work is in that tale of the distribution, autism and developmental disabilities, I don't believe autism is a unified thing that's diagnosed, so I don't think they're gonna come up with a pill that cures it or a shot. But I certainly can envision a time, maybe not in the too distant future, where society says we're simply not willing to spend the money on it that we are because compared to the other problems we're facing, we can't afford it. And that would be the equivalent because our lifeblood would go away or a lot of it would. And then where are we? If that's what we're doing, people's jobs go away. Our academic positions go away, all of that stuff. So I think diversity is incredibly important to foster. We need to do that. So now is the time for some audience questions. And this is the, uh, this is the first time I, I'm actually soliciting uh, questions from a live audience. This is scary. And I would love, if you do have questions, to come up and actually talk into the microphone so it gets recorded. <laughs> and I have reinforcers. These are drink tickets. <laughs> so... So, uh, all right, so this is how it works. What I'd like you to do is say your name and uh, uh, the company you work for, and then ask your question, then we'll, that way we can get a little, some shout outs to, to, okay. to everyone, so. So can you hear me, or do I yeah, have to worry fine. about that? Yeah. Okay. Just keep it close to your mouth, so okay. yeah. My Perfect. name is Danielle Epperheimer. Uh, I'm with Little Star ABA. Um, and my question is, with your research with children um, and activity, is there data behind the Play 60, or do you rec- recommend something different for length of time versus steps versus you brought up interval training versus study training. So do you have recommendations? Yeah, so that's a good question uh, as she takes her free drink coupon and runs back to her seat. <laughs> um, so Play 60 is, is an NFL program. And as it turns out, the Play 60 program doesn't actually make really specific recommendations of what you're supposed to do beyond, guess what, Play 60. Um, 
what is that supposed to look like? We, we wanted to look into programs like that a number of years ago. Uh, and because Play 60 didn't have specific recommendations, we looked elsewhere. And we found uh, a program called Playworks that conveniently enough ended up being uh, located, headquartered in Oakland, California, which is was just up the road from us. So what we did is we got some schools in Stockton, California, who were use, going to use Playworks. They agreed to stagger the intervention of the Playworks program, which basically involves Playworks people coming out and teaching school personnel at recess how to facilitate physical activity. And they're supposed to be the people who know how to do this. We were interested in this because up until that point, our attempts at increasing physical activity in kids sucked hard. We just, we were not good. And we thought maybe we're just not good at what we do, right? So here is a program that's supposed to be good at it. So it's like us play 60, but they have specific strategies to do this. So we evaluated the amount of physical activity the kids were engaging in on the playground at recess prior to the implementation of play 60, or not play 60, uh, Playworks, and then after. And what we found is, not only did it not increase physical activity, it decreased it. And the reason was because the structured games they were largely using made it so that kids spent most of their time waiting around for their next opportunity to be active. So yeah, they had an opportunity to be active when that came around, but then they had to wait a long time. So I'm not, we looked, we tried to find programs that actually had sort of prescriptions. And we really couldn't find them. They, they don't seem to exist. Um, I will plug a study that we published um, a couple years ago now, maybe. Lots of like the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the World Health Organization recommend that parents play with their kids to get them more active. And one study that, that we did and published, um, we wanted to know, is that enough? That's basically non-contingent reinforcement, right? Just play with your kids no matter what they do versus what if you just play with your kids when they're engaged in VPA? And I don't think any behavior analyst is surprised at what we found. If you play with your kid when they're engaged in VPA, you get MVPA, which is moderate to vigorous physical activity, if I haven't explained that. And if you just play with your kid no matter what they do, guess what? You don't get moderate to vigorous physical activity. So it's important how you play with your kid. And again, we all know that. We appreciate that. Most people don't appreciate that. Uh, and I would imagine those programs don't appreciate that in their guidelines. All right, next. Uh, Jill Humphrey, I work for Spring Health Behavioral Services. Um, as a newly minted BCBA, um, I have my master's in education. I was a school teacher for 10 years. Um, led down the road from a kid, you know, lots of extra research after school, found the ABA, tiny town, I'm from a tiny town, no clue what that was, and I'm like, where's the spin on my life? Enrolled in a program, and it's very, very different than what, as an educator, I was ever taught, but it, it is the answer to all the problems in education, it really is. Where are we in regards to getting, or how can we get ABA and BCBAs in school systems and widespread? Well, well, I think that's a great Thanks, question. Jill. Unfortunately, I am by no means an expert to answer that question. I mean, I, I have that same question, and maybe someone else can answer that question. I, you know, I don't have any specific suggestions about this, but I agree that's a huge need. Um, and I'm not sure. But part of it is that we really, I think, need to be those people. We, we need behavior analysts to become school teachers, to become school administrators. And so there's, I think, a glimmer of hope in that we do have strongholds in some school psychology programs. So folks who are interested in behavior analysis can go get PhDs in school psychology with good behavior analytic training, and then they are school psychologists. I mean, you get licensed as a school psychologist, and you can go and then influence the systems in which you work as a member of that system. But I think it's going to be increasingly important that we become members of those professional communities rather than this 
odd arrangement, as I, I mentioned in my talk this morning, of knocking on everybody's door and telling them what they're doing wrong and how we can tell them what to do better. I just don't see that as successful in the long run. All right. Any other, any other questions? All right. Come on up. All right. Hi, I'm Melissa Chevalier from Hope Bridge. I really enjoyed your talk earlier today about diversity in the field and, and was thinking along the lines of the changes that the board is recently making to go back to, you know, years ago when I first got into the field. Um, educational programs were accepted from a wide variety of fields. Uh, we moved as an organization, or not as an organization, we moved as a field to a very limited and I feel like we're going back to expanding and diversifying again. Um, how do you see that playing into kind of where you were going this morning on diversity in our field and how we can work alongside professionals within other fields uh, throughout the country and around the world uh, to promote the field of behavior analysis? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. Let me start by saying a few things. One is I am by no means an official spokesperson for the Behavior Analyst Certification Board. Nothing that I'm going to say <laughs> reflects any official position of the BACB. Um, I will say that I have great confidence in the leadership at the BACB uh, and the, not only the decisions they make, but the way that they, they try to make their decisions. Uh, I'm not sure that I would characterize the changes as going back to the way it was, and I, and I think it's a tricky bit of business because certainly um, as behavior analysts, we're all very aware that it takes more than a handful of classes to really get you up to speed to be able to go out and do this stuff. So to really just open it up to just about any degree is not without its problems, right? So you understand why you want to rein it in a little bit. Um, but having said that, I also agree that we want to be able to play with others as well. Although I will point out that most of those other fields that we would want to play with don't allow us to play with them based on our degree, right? But we're not necessarily in a position of strength, so maybe we want to be a little more flexible uh, at the outset. I will say, I think I can say this, uh, the BACB is doing things. I've been involved in, in going to be in the near future involved in another work group meeting on diversifying the practice of behavior analysis. And it involves people from areas outside of our mainstream and trying to come up with ways, maybe not that the BACB does, but just ways that our field can diversify our practice. Um, I'm heartened that there are people interested in it. There are people in our field doing diverse work and trying to think of ways to move into areas like you're saying. And I'm also heartened that the BACB, to the extent it can, has tried to support those efforts. You know, they, they're constrained as a credentialing agency in, in many of the things they can do, but they try to do as much as they can within those constraints to address problems that they're well aware of too. Like, how do we do that? But I, I don't have, here are the five steps that will make it happen. All right, we're going to take a couple more questions here, but I wanted to throw something in here real quick. So, Matt, when you're teaching a class, do you approve of people being on social media, either on their phones or laptops? In class? In class, while you're teaching. No. No, all right. I think if I was teaching, I'd probably have the same point of view. But we're not teaching, so if you are on social media, what we want you to do is uh, post pictures or any other type of impressions you have, uh, is there a uh, hashtag Haba2018? Will that work? Or who's your ABA? All right, we're gonna get that. Gonna get that right. Okay. All right. We're definitely not in Hawaii. Uh, I think, unless I'm incredibly confused, or the, <laughs> unless this bourbon is, is is as good as promised. Matt's been doing most of the talking, which has allowed me to sample perhaps more of it than I'm a little ahead of, <laughs> of him. So yeah. So just uh, make sure you, you do that. Uh, yeah. Uh, tag uh, who's your ABA. Um, tag behavioral observations, uh, the daily BA. Ryan's uh, kicking in with some footage here, so um, so just do that. So all right, let's get let's get in with some questions here. All right, we got uh, a gentleman in the back here. I haven't forgot about you either. All right, all right, uh, Vince from Applied Behavior Center for Autism, uh, Steve from CBA who 
provided the bourbon, and I had a question about behavior analysts, if any of them are doing research into physical activity with video games, because it seems with my kids ever since the Wii, and of course I do think back to uh, my wife and the, what was that running game that they used to have with the little mats beforehand? Like physical activity has become more and more of video games. Uh, is anyone doing some research into kind of trying to promote the use of uh, video games to make kids more and more active, especially as the um, technology continues to develop. Well, thank you. I love it when someone asks a question that I can actually answer in the affirmative <laughs> and say something. Um, so with that, I can say yes. In the way that we would want the research done, there's not a ton, but Ray Miltenberger at the University of South Florida has published research on exergaming uh, and using exergaming in physical education classrooms and things like that. Uh, and it does work. I mean, there are some problems with it in that it's expensive to get it implemented and stuff like that, but it, it is, it seems, much more effective than traditional arrangements in PE classes. So Ray has published most of that stuff in Java. You can look that up on exergaming, yeah. Any, any other questions? Oh. oh, did you get your ticket? Oh, no. <laughs> 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 uh, but my name is Rob Angus. I'm a BCBA. And I don't know if this is a question or more of an admission of guilt, but uh, my, my master's degree is originally in a marriage and family therapy. And I can... Oh, I, don't, I don't know why that's so funny. <laughs> Just kidding. But I, I will say that when I got into this field, I was excited to work with children who were diagnosed with autism. And I went into it for all the right reasons. And then after I took day one, class one of the ABA program, I thought what the hell am I doing? I thought it was just a certification program. I had no idea what it was all about. And I think that's a consensus out in the field when I work with the schools and other professionals is that they really don't understand what it is we do. And so we come in and we provide all these suggestions and interventions and they think, we've been doing this for years in our school setting. Don't come in here and tell us what we can do. So do you have any suggestions as to how we can promote ourselves in the field more effectively? Um, well, first, let me say, I think you know that's pretty accurate observation. And if you look at the numbers, right, where we work, and if you even, and I don't think these are public data, but if you look at the, the submission numbers to uh, the conference, uh, the Association Be Behavior Analysis Conference, uh, ABAI, most of the work is in autism and developmental disabilities. So one thing that I think it's important to understand is that it's not incorrect for people to associate what we do with interventions for autism and developmental disabilities. Because if it was any other field, that's how we would view them. Right inside the field is different, but if any bean counter came around and simply looked at the work we did, the conclusion would be, we're that. So when we start talking about more sort of deeper <laughs> issues about human behavior and stuff, I'm sure that's startling to many people because that's not what they're signed on for. They view it as a sort of behavior change technology with that population. Um, I, probably the best strategies are not unique to behavior analysts trying to disseminate. It's just how to win friends and influence people, right? And, and think of what it's like when someone comes to you saying these things. And no one likes to be told they're doing it wrong. No one likes that. Especially no one, teachers? Yes. My, my wife's a teacher, trust me. <laughs> yeah, and, and so definitely, and by the way, I'm not, I say all this and it's not like I'm awesome. There's a reason I don't do clinical work, right? <laughs> I, I help oversee our clinical work. Holly White is our director of clinical services and she keeps me away from the real important stuff because I would be a nightmare in there. She has wonderful clinical skills and can talk to these people. Uh, and that's what we need, are people with just really good clinical skills. I don't think it's unique to what we're trying to disseminate. It's just how you try to disseminate anything or get people to try what you have to offer. And the way to do it is not to say, you're doing that wrong. Do it this way instead. All right. Any other questions from the audience? I see a hand in the back. Come on down. Come get your drink ticket. I'm um, Hannah Sauber from Meaningful Day Services. Um, going back to your research on critical thinking, do you could you speak more about like that area, and do you kind of see it almost as like a pivotal skill at the population level as far as 
ABA branching out into other fields. You kind of talked briefly about earlier today about common like traditional mindset uh, barriers to ABA. Like, why do I have to reinforce something that people um, should be doing anyway? And I feel like that's that's the really common barrier that seems to, like there are very simple, straightforward, uh, rational explanations mm -hmm. to that, but like critical thinking skills would be make those more well recepted and just like acceptance of science. Mm -hmm. um, is there lots of research in that area? Critical thinking also seems like a very complex yeah. thing to teach. Yeah, and, and, and so let's see. So one of your questions can be answered easily. Is there a lot of research in that area? No, <laughs> and that's the problem. Uh, is the research we're doing going to answer your questions? No, because we are taking baby steps. We're just trying to teach them 13 logical fallacies. Can they name them, identify them, uh, if we give them an example and, and tell us the definition of them? That's not critical thinking. That's a component of critical thinking. Um, it's a complicated issue. I think as scientists, we have to be comfortable saying, I don't know. Uh, a number of years ago, I, I went to UC Berkeley and saw Richard Dawkins, the evolutionary biologist. Most people just know him as the guy who hates God, but he's actually an evolutionary biologist and, and wrote a lot of stuff in addition to the God delusion. Um, and his talk was about a range of things in biology, and one of the things that really stood out to me is during the Q&A period, Right, all these people are asking him question after question, and he just kept saying, I don't know. I don't know. We don't know. I don't know the answer to that. He wasn't making stuff up. And, and what I would say, we don't know the answer. We're not there yet. We can't come up with those answers. Um, I think probably the best thing we have, uh, we were talking about this earlier in a different context, multiple exemplar training and then hope, like hell, <laughs> they keep doing it in new places, right? But that... That's not much of a sophisticated understanding. Like, let's just keep giving them multiple exemplars and hope they get it. We don't know how they're getting it or why they're getting it or what the minimal requirements are, but I think that's what we're left with mm -hmm. right now. So anybody out there who wants a research line, be a great research line to go into because nobody's figured it out. Can I give you one already? All right. Uh, oh, she, 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 she tried to double dip, folks. <laughs> Are you familiar with some of the fit learning stuff? Um, Be are you more specific. The f company fit learning? I, I'm aware of the company, but I don't always, my equivalence classes aren't always as strong as they could be. So I I'm not sure, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so they're doing, so you, one of the areas of uh, getting more under the curve that you mentioned today, I think you alluded to is uh, tutoring programs mm -hmm. and things like that. And so that is a, that is a company that has locations worldwide. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things they do focus on is critical thinking, using precision teaching uh, uh, with some you know, uh, RFT yeah. and other types of interventions and, uh, along those lines. But that, that is one area where there is movement in that direction yeah. and it's all applied and it's all working. With, not all, I mean, they serve a individual. I, I would say most of their, or many of their uh, uh, do not have any type of identification or anything like yeah, that. Yeah. So there's you know, typically developing. And so I um, just want to mention that, but they do some work in the, the critical thinking area. That might be something to check out as you guys are exploring yeah. this. So um, got a few drink tickets left, uh, or we can wrap this up if we are uh, out of audience questions. You guys have been awesome. I, I thought I'd be pulling teeth, but I guess when you have powerful reinforcers, <laughs> surprise, surprise. You get some. You get some responding. So, uh, all right, Matt. Uh, and uh, before we close, I just want to again thank uh, the, the Hoosier Association for having us out here, for setting all this up, for giving us this opportunity. This has been great fun. Um, so let's close with some parting advice for the newly minted BCBA. The newly minted. No BC pressure. No pressure. It, it, you know, I've been thinking about this all evening. What? What is my advice? Ag agonizing over it, clearly. Agonizing. Oh, I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I think the main thing I would say is be a great behavior analyst. And the way to do that, and, and I'm, I'm saying this because I experience this a lot in my students and, and when I meet people at conferences, um, our field, I think, 
is unique in, in many ways with respect to other fields. Our research and practice are very closely related. It's not so close in other areas. And I know a lot of people say they don't think it is, but I, I, I don't think they've had good mentorship in reading our research. But I think you need to keep reading our research, right? So I, I meet folks all the time and I ask them, oh, did you read that paper in Java? Oh, you're interested in that. Did you read that paper in Java? No, no. What? That, then how are you going to be an effective behavior analyst? How are you going to be a breath? Everybody in this room, I hope, has a subscription to Java. That's your flagship journal. People say, I don't know how to apply that to your practice. Then what the hell are you practicing? Matt, does, does reading the abstract count? Um, <laughs> It won't get you a drink ticket, <laughs> okay? Right. Uh, Fair enough. So my advice is to know your research literature. So one of the things at the University of the Pacific that we do in our clinical supervision meetings is students can't just get up, and this is what I hear a lot of people doing, sort of inventing things based on their general understanding of reinforcement. That might be necessary and that might prove useful, but we have a rich literature base that you should be familiar with. So we make our students cite and explain, review the articles that inform the interventions they're selecting based on their assessments. And actually, we often require them to make these side-by-side -side tables where they task analyze what was done in the original article and they have to be able to explain why and then they lay out what they're proposing and they have to highlight every place it's different and justify why it's different. But they have to keep their practice tied to the literature. I love Java. I mean, and if people say, well, Java is so specific, it only does this. No, then you're not reading Java. I, I, I'm a reviewer, I've been an associate editor of Java. The, I see an incredible diversity of manuscripts coming through. We can always have more, I mean, there's no doubt, but there's a lot in there. And I don't know how a behavior analyst can read Java and not immediately see ties to their practice. Um, so I think a lot of times people spin their wheels trying to figure out the solution to their problem. When the solution to their problem has been figured out 12 times before, and 15 years before by a bunch of different people. You just have to go look for it. So I, I actually, I was gonna say something that's a lie. Um, <laughs> my favorite day used to be when Java came in the mail. It was like, oh, Java, I get to read the new Java. Right now it's all online and I get the little contents alerts and every time a new article comes out it shows and I go read it then. So the issue of Java actually is not as exciting anymore because I've already read all the early view articles. But, but the idea is still there. I get very fired up. And I tell you, I read every article published in Java. Now admittedly, some of them that are not really relevant to what I do, I, I, I just kind of read the intro, skim the methods, read the discussion. No, I, I'm not gonna lie, I do that. Look, um, at, look at the pictures. Yeah, <laughs> there are pictures? <laughs> Damn. Um, but you, yeah, you should be reading it. It's one of the things, when I, when I got my PhD, I hadn't done this yet, but I started a program for myself of reading every article every, ever published in Java. Because I, I, you know, I came in way after, so I had to go back, and I did. That doesn't mean I remember all those articles. I know some people who do, and they're freaks. Uh, I can't cite, you know, all the details to you. I tried it with JAB, and I got through about 1978, and then it got real spotty after that. That's but impressive, I, though. But I think you should do that. You should be intimately familiar with our at least our applied research base. That's going to help you immensely in whatever you do. All right, that's great advice to end on. Matt Norman, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.